For just over a year, the Reserve Bank kept hiking interest rates and they got to the highest level in decades. And there were lots of warnings about an imminent collapse of Australia's housing markets. And it didn't just come from the normal property pessimists, but also from the banks and institutional economists. Not many people expected interest rates to rise so high and rise so fast. And not many people expected that the most interest rate sensitive portion of our economy, our housing markets, would be so resilient. But in our regular chats on this podcast, my guest today, financial advisor Stuart Weems, and I, we were nowhere near as pessimistic as most others. So how did all those housing bears get it so wrong? And whose advice should you listen to for what's ahead for property? That's what we're going to be discussing in today's show. So welcome to another episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. In preparation for my chat today, I did some research on what some of the so-called experts had predicted was going to happen to property values over the last little while. And my conclusion was you shouldn't pay too much attention. In fact, you probably should ignore most economists. Look, in general, those quoted in the media come from the banks or major institutions, and they seem to have no clue to what's really happening on the ground in our property markets, as opposed to maybe what's happening on the spreadsheets in their CBD towers. And then, of course, over the last little while, there was the regular pack of very hangry housing bears who were all confidently growling that the local property prices would slump by their largest margins on record. But today I'm joined by my regular guest, independent financial advisor, Stuart Weems, Director of ProSolution Private Clients, who's consistently had a, a more positive and in my mind, more realistic view of what's going on in our property markets. Hi, Stuart. Hey, Michael. Great to be back with you again. Well, clearly our property markets turned the corner earlier this year. And again, each state's are running at its own pace, at its own stage in the property cycle. But if you go back to just the end of last year, the Reserve Bank suggested house prices could still plummet. Uh, I remember those headlines there. They thought it could even drop 15 to 25%. Now, that was their worst case scenario. At the same time, National Australia Bank forecast a 20% fall. Westpac called for a 16% fall. ANZ thought property values could slump 18%. But I remember we once a month get together on these chats and in between you and I have our talks anyway. And last year, we both had a different view. We saw at the end of last year, already the rate of house price falls decreasing, asking prices started to rise. And both of us early this year called property market bottom. And now half a year later, the banks have come along and finally realised what's going on in the market, Stuart. There's two factors that we need to think about or consider when reading these forecasts. I mean, there's probably more, but the two that, that sort of jump to my mind, the, the two things that they don't really consider or to, to my mind or have ability to think about, firstly, is the psychology of home buyers, homeowners, let's say homeowners, whether they're investors or own occupiers. So the psychology aspect. And then the second element is what's going on in the ground. What, what is actually happening on the ground? If you go to an auction, is it well attended? Are there a lot of bidders? Is no one bidding? Is no one going through open houses? These sorts of things give you a really good idea how people are reacting to the economic data of the day. Now, if you don't have those two things, it's difficult to come up with a reliable property forecast. And I will say it's challenging to forecast any market in the short term, of course, it really is a fool's errand. I mean, you, you, they have to do it. That's part of their job, but they're probably, you know, actually speaking to a lot of those economists, they don't really enjoy doing it because they, they more often than not look like fools because the, the forecast is wrong. 
I know during COVID, uh, it was much more difficult and no one really knew what was ahead. So I think they're excused for getting it wrong in 2019. But boy, were there some changes. Just in the last little while, National Australia Bank changed its forecast. Now they're predicting a rise of 4.7% in home values by the end of the year. And that's just nine months after they said there'd be a 20% fall, Stuart. But a lot of parts of Australia... Brisbane, Sydney, Perth have already had more than that rise already. They're out of touch. And just recently, Westpac significantly increased its expectations. It's tipping values to rise nationally 7% this year. I think a lot of it's got to do with the fact that they're now seeing that we're close to or at the peak of interest rates, Stuart. And also, I think that they would have expected, or at least implied in their forecasts, is that they would have expected perhaps more for sales by now more financial stress, which is not to say that there's there's no financial stress, but the point that both you and I understand is understanding the psychology of homeowners is that they will endure significant financial stress before they get to the point of deciding to sell their asset. You know, they will do everything absolutely possible not to have to sell their family home or even an investment property because they realise in the long run, if they can get through the hard times, that they realise in the long run they'll be much better off for holding on to that asset. I think I suspect that's why they've changed their forecast. Not only are we close to the top of the interest rate cycle, but we just haven't seen the level of distress in terms of distress sales that maybe people anticipated that we would see a year ago. But again, you and I knew that you know everyone's going to do everything possible not to not to have to sell. Well, there's a number of reasons why they forecast distress sales. First of all, interest rates did rise significantly. They went up four percentage points over a really short period of time. And that affected some people, but not everybody's affected by interest rates. We know that half of homeowners don't even have a mortgage. And so it really affected some people more than others. The cost of living affected, arises affected some people more than others. The cost of rents affected some people more than others. So in- interest rates didn't work as well this time around. But I think there was another reason was that we went into this interest rate uh, rise with, with quite significant cash buffers, savings, because we couldn't spend our money over COVID. And a lot of people had actually prepaid their mortgages, Stuart. And most of the people that transacted through the COVID period, so 2020 to 2022, were higher income earners. They were higher value assets. They weren't just generally everyone. And the the reason for that is that the people that preserved and maximised their income during COVID were people that could continue to work from home. So that that typically white collar professionals that were able to work from home, whereas, you know, people like in hospitality or cleaners or um, tradies or so forth, they obviously can't work from home and they had a large impact to their income. So by definition then, and you could certainly see it in all the stats and certainly see it in the property market, particularly a luxury property market, that's where a lot of the transactions were. And so people were definitely overpaying for property during that period of time because you'd see some transactions and I I know myself and I'm sure you're the same, Michael, you'd sit there shaking your head thinking, how can someone pay that much? But they can afford to do so. You know, they, they had a lot of cash in the bank. They preserve their income. And I think the other thing we need to remind ourselves is we go, oh, rates are really high today. Are they? Like if you take no. a twenty year yeah, you take a twenty year view, and I know people love to reference, you know, early nineties when rates got eighteen percent and so forth, and, and that's an aberration, like, you know, that's a very unique kind of set of circumstances. But even if you look uh, more broader than that, you know, you can just say I think I would say instead of saying rates have risen so much and they're so high at the moment. I would prefer to look at it by saying, wow, what a free kick we had in the last five years because rates were well below trend and now they've just kind of normalised. Now, I imagine they're going to come back. Like I think we're probably at the peak and they will come back a little bit. But have some context to sort of say, you know, we had a period where rates were so great. And I know you and I were talking during those periods is is trying to encourage people to to do some smart things with their money during that time, you know, that they had – the cost of debt was so low, they had the opportunity to maybe go and buy another asset or pay down debt or, you know, invest in other assets like super and so forth. Mm. So so hopefully people can look back and go, well, last five years, you know, rates were really low. Did I make the most of those opportunities? Because, you know, it's cyclical, rates will come down. 
uh, again one day and that opportunity will present itself again. Sure. I think the other thing they missed was the supply and demand ratio. In other words, we went into this cycle with an undersupply of properties. In the past, property booms in the past have ended when there's suddenly large amounts of building, a large oversupply, particularly apartment buildings, and eventually there was not enough people to take it up. It was very different this time around. Exactly right. And that that was one of the most compelling things that I considered with respect to my expectations of what would happen to property prices. If we are going to see property prices fall, and I'm not saying it's impossible, it could it could very well happen sometime in the future. But if it does happen, what you need obviously is more sellers than buyers. Now, you will get that if you get distressed sales. The problem is with distressed sales is that you need somewhere to live. People need somewhere to live. So in in a tight rental market, you know, that that is an alternative. And as I said previously, people do everything absolutely possible before they go and sell their home. So my view was, okay, discretionary sellers are going to evaporate. Like if you you wanted to sell, but you didn't have to for any particular reason, you're not going to sell in a market that's not so great, not buoyant. So you would just delay it. So then my thinking was, well, um, listings are going to fall, which is exactly what happened. You know, discretionary discretionary sellers just evaporated. When you went to auctions or open houses, what you found was that what, there weren't many properties to buy, but and certainly demand for property had reduced, but not to the extent, or at least not by a greater extent, as sellers did. And so it was kind of the market was still kind of in equilibrium in terms of there was enough buyers to accommodate the the sellers. And that's why we didn't see any sort of price movements. And that's the problem with housing, right, in terms of an asset class. If we look at shares and we say, look, the fundamentals are off or, you know, there's a lot of kind of risk off appetite in the share market, I can go and sell all my shares tomorrow and I can still go home and sit and watch TV at night and my lifestyle doesn't change. With property, we live in it and we need a home to live in. And so it it is going to react differently. And so if I'm if I'm an economist and I'm looking at some modeling and forecasting GDP and unemployment and interest rates and mortgage arrear rates and all those sorts of things, and I'm kind of doing that analysis in a phone box without thinking about the broader world outside of that room, uh, you know, of course I'm going to make mistakes because it's that psychology element and then what is actually happening on the ground. Well, I think one of the lessons from this is that our property markets are not just driven by fundamentals. Now, even on the fundamentals, they weren't that bad. The predictions of severe property falls had never occurred to that extent before, so there was no even fundamental reason why we should have double-digit property price falls. But I think uh, a lesson we're both trying to say to people listening to this is is the often irrational and erratic behaviour of a crowd of people. And we know that during the past booms and busts, they've really been driven by, I guess, what we call fear and greed, people wanting to get into the market, people are getting a bit of FOMO already now as well. So you can't just look at the fundamentals, even though they're critical, you've also got to understand human behaviour. And one of the things, as you clearly said, is people would rather eat magic noodles than sell up their homes. And while a lot of people are listening to this thinking about property as an investment, remember 70% of properties are owned by homeowners. And as you say, what are they going to do? They're not going to sell up anyway. I think if we base the next bit of the discussion on that, the other thing is, what are your own emotional responses? How are you feeling? How are you affected by what's going on? I guess it's hard, Stuart, when there's a continual conveyor belt of negative messages in the media. I know over time, a lot of the clients who approach us at Metropole are nervous. They're waiting to hear that everything's okay, that it's all right, uh, that we've hit past the bottom. They've missed out. The bottom was earlier this year. There's never a, there's never going to be a magical sign to say now is the best time to buy property and there's no risk associated with that decision. There's always going to be a reason why not to do it. And look, decision making is really, really challenging. And uh, I remember reading a story about the DMV, the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, whatever it's called in Holland versus Belgium. And in Bel- in Belgium, the amount of people that have elected to be organ donors as a result of, you know, they do it, uh, it's associated with their license, 
the driver's license is very high at something like 80%. In Holland, it's very low, it's less than 10%. And the difference between Belgium and Holland, because really you think about culturally and so forth, they're very sort of similar countries. The difference is in Belgium, you have to opt out of it, whereas in Holland, you've got to opt in. And so decision-making, and that's a perfect example that decision-making is very difficult. And in the, when faced with a decision, it's much easier not to decide which is exactly what they're doing in Belgium. They're just not ticking the box to opt out and they and voila, they're, they're organ donors. And so it's not really the decision itself, it's just how difficult it is. And if you then are faced with some risk, uh, so some negative noise about the property market, it's much easier to say to yourself, you know what, I'm not going to say never, but just not now. Now just doesn't seem like the right time. The chorus is sort of singing to say that property is going to drop. So I would be an idiot to buy today because if it does drop in 10%, you know, 10% in the next six months, I can buy the same property cheaper. And so you tell yourself that story. The problem is you're right. You've got to try and if you want to sort of play that out, you've got to try and pick the bottom of the market. And that's really challenging to do, particularly if you're making your own financial decision. As a financial advisor, uh, of course, I have an emotional vested interest in making sure my clients do well. I certainly don't want them not not to do well. Uh, but it's a lot different to making your own personal financial decisions. I know if I when I go and buy an asset, a, a property, or you know something that that's a, a lot of money, even though I've done it many times before and for a long period of time. You know, it still gives you a little bit of indigestion in terms of, you know, hope this is going to be, this is the right asset. I hope, you know, spending millions of dollars on this particular property is going to work out for me. So even when it's, even for a seasoned professional like myself, it's still difficult. And, and so if you're not a seasoned professional, it's even difficult again. So that's the problem with trying to pick the bottom of the market is that actually, if you're going to be realistic about it, you're just not going to have the fortitude to buy at the bottom of the market because buying at the bottom of the market, by definition, is buying when the, the all the negative news is the loudest. And that's really challenging to do. It is. So there seem to be two groups of people out there at the moment. There's the perpetual property bears, and they still seem to be ignoring the evidence. There's one who writes for the financial review who still, I don't think, doesn't admit that he got it wrong this time when he's got things right very often in the past. People hold strong beliefs and holding them for the long term can be dangerous. I mean, it's one of the cognitive biases we've spoken about before. Uh, you, you look for all the confirmation bias evidence, evidence that to prove that your already preconceived theory is the right one. And often you forget what's really happening. Yeah, and that's why I like to follow an evidence-based approach, Michael, because if I look at all the evidence and all the evidence says, Stuart, take this path, then I don't need to worry about my emotions or at least allows me to curtail the amount that my emotions will influence my decision making. So what I'd like to propose then is that if I'm contemplating a property investment, then it's very likely, or at least it should be, that I'm contemplating holding this asset for many decades certainly more than 10 years, uh, let's hope 20 or even 30 years, because we know the longer you hold the asset, the more powerful compounding capital growth is, particularly in dollar terms. So if I'm going to buy this property, I'm going to hold it for 20 years, who cares what happens to prices in the next two years or even the next five years? Really, who cares? Just so long as when I wake up in 10 or 15, 20 years time, the property is worth a lot more multiples of what I've paid for it, then it's worked for me. Who cares what happens in the next two years? Now, that's a difficult concept to get your head around because what it means is you might look like an idiot in a year's time. But but the reality is you, you, you look like a superstar in 10 or 15 years' time, so who cares? And if you follow that evidence-based approach, the evidence tells us it actually doesn't matter when you buy. Even in the, in the property market, it has half the volatility of shares. Even the studies in the share market tell us it doesn't matter when you buy because the timing of when you make an investment will, the, the impact of the timing when you make an investment will evaporate the longer you hold it. So in two years' time, the timing of that investment will be quite material. In 10 years' time, it'll be 
barely on the radar. And in 20 years' time, it won't have any impact on your total return. And that's what the evidence tells us in a market that has twice as much volatility. So in a market that has half the volatility like the property market, it's even timing is even less important, even in the short term. Now, we have both been through this before ourselves when we started off. And so we've spoken in the past about your first property in Moorabbin Mine in Caulfield and how expensive it was. And we didn't understand any of that sort of stuff. But if we just held on to those today, look how much they've gone up in value. So what you're saying is right. I think implicit in what you're saying is don't look for the next hotspot. So often, Stuart, you've said buy the best quality asset you can. So rather than look for what's going to work now or in the next year or two, look for what's always worked and what's likely to be in continuous strong demand in the future. So one of the things I guess we're saying is be careful whose advice you listen to. And there's a lot of people with very well-meaning advice. I mean, these economists who are coming up with these ideas are not being wrong on purpose. They're giving the best advice they can to the public, but also to their employer because the banks are making their lending decisions based on these forecasts, which I guess is a concern on its own. But also at the moment, Stuart, I'm finding a whole new wave of people who are giving advice, calling themselves experts, because they did well during the boom of 2021 when almost anyone can. There's a new reality TV show that I haven't watched called Location, 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 and a common friend of ours, Kate Bakos, just recently came out to say how now reality TV stars rather than buyers, agents, or property people are giving advice on where to buy and all the mistakes that can come from that. It actually doesn't seem that the threshold of being calling yourself an expert is very high anymore. In the old days, you had to be a leader in your field. You had to have years of experience. You'd had to have uh, been uh, through a couple of cycles. Now, I think with social media, anyone can, I guess, look like an expert. Yeah, that's right, Michael. And you've got to think about it logically. Again, I return to the investment time horizon. If you're owning an asset for 20 plus years, you want to buy a type of asset in a location that's going to give you the highest return on average over that 20 year time period. What you're not trying to do is find a pocket or sector or geographical location that's going to outperform over the next five years and then do nothing for the next 15. Because that's actually not going to help you achieve your aim. And your aim is to buy a property today and for it to double in value, 7.2% compounding return, which is pretty average, double in value on average over a 10-year period. So if I buy a million dollars today, that property is worth $4 million in 20 years. If you can do that and you can execute on that, you've done your job, right? That That's going to build a lot of wealth for you in dollar terms and that'll that'll help most people you know, achieve a, a really good retirement. So then the key aim is not picking the next growth cycle, in fact, or even trying to predict what's going to happen over the next couple of years. The key is getting the highest return over that full 20-year period. And so the problem then is listening to people that have made money over the last two or three or five years or even 10 years and following uh, their process is that it's not always repeatable. You know, just because a outlying suburb has tremendous growth over a very short period of time doesn't mean it's got the fundamentals to continue that growth trajectory for another two decades. That's really interesting because only a couple of days ago, I remember I got an email from a client at Metropole who we we bought an apartment in Sydney's inner west in a great suburb. And while it had actually gone up in value considerably, she actually wondered whether she'd done the right thing because she watched a video on YouTube. She actually sent it to me about a so-called property guru who bought multiple properties in the last couple of years and now is ready to retire at 30. And she, she asked me, have I done, I know I've read your books, I've read your blogs, I listen to your podcast, but, but reassure me, have I done the right thing? And even she told me, she wrote in her email, well, I've read your quote from Warren Buffett, wealth is the transfer of money from the impatient to the patient. But she couldn't still help wondering had she followed the wrong path. And I know where she was coming from. She was wondering whether these individuals on social media were truly astute investors or, or merely fortunate outliers. You know, these get-rich-quick experts. I remember uh, Nassim Taleb uh, 
who wrote that great book called People Like That. And no disrespect to this particular person, he called them lucky idiots because in the short term, mm. uh, the, the, they, they did well, but it's hard to differentiate them from skilled investors. Yeah, and normally those people, their core competency is marketing, particularly self-promotion rather than uh, investment know-how and experience and so forth. So just because you read it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And that's the thing too, to, to really make friends with. If, if you're going to buy a property that has really strong long-term fundamentals, it's not only possible, but it's entirely likely that there'll be locations, geographical locations that will outperform that property over the next five years. There's always going to be, there's always going to be uh, areas that don't have very strong fundamentals that are grow at a much faster pace. That's fine. Again, it's it's uh, it's a marathon. It's not a race. And we want to pick an asset that has the fundamentals drive long term capital growth. And that's the thing with forecasting. And you made the point before, Michael, to say that what happens in the short term isn't necessarily driven by fundamentals. Uh, I mean, be influenced a little bit, but not not wholly, because we've talked about psychology and all these and and what's happening on the ground and those sorts of things. But long term, uh, long term over decade periods, it's driven by fundamentals, one hundred percent. Well, that's what I said to this lady. In the western suburbs of Sydney, an apartment in an old established block of six, uh, which had its own on-site car park, the land component is so rare nowadays, walking distance to a great shopping strip, those fundamentals are only going to become more valuable over the long term, Stuart. Yeah, exactly right. That's where you can find the safety. That's where you can get the confidence with the asset. It's focus on the fundamentals, not the noise that might be going around at the time and sometimes the shiny objects of, hey, look, there might be a quicker way to make money or make more money. It's not about that slow and steady. It, it's it's not about trying to do something new. It's just repeating the, the evidence-based approach that, you know, lots and lots and lots of people have used to build incredible wealth. It just, all it requires is a lot of discipline to hold fast, uh, it, particularly during the tough times. And patience, you know, property and most investments, it's true, they require many decades to really drive huge amounts of capital growth or capital return in dollar value. Well, I have been around long enough. I've still actually got in my study here old copies of Australian Property Investor Magazine right from the first days and your investment property magazine when they had uh, hard copy magazines. And when you look back every now and then and see I play this little game, where are they today? And a lot of the people who were the gurus at the time are no longer there and the, the systems they came up with were just luck and being in the right place at the right time. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to say it right, but there was a, a story I remember reading that Warren Buffett mentioned along the same lines that sometimes people are just lucky. And he illustrated this by, at the time, I was way back, uh, saying, let's have a coin flipping contest where all of America's population, and at that time it was something like 225 million people way back then, everyone starts with $1. And what they do is have a coin flipping competition. And if they get it heads or tails right, see who's left behind. And he said in 10 days time in the contest, 220 people, 220,000 people from the 22, 225 million uh, would still be in that have called it correctly, each making a thousand dollars. And uh, human nature would make these people say, Hey, look, I'm an expert. I'm a real expert in coin flipping. And they'd go on social media if there was such a thing and say, you know, I'll, I'll teach you all how to make a million dollars out of coin flipping. But then another 10 days later, 215 individuals would remain and then win a million dollars. So what he was saying was it's a matter of luck. And this small group would actually sort of write a book, how I turned uh, a dollar into a million dollars in 20 days with working 30 seconds a day. <laughs> <laughs> and then Warren Buffett went on to say something the same as you could do exactly the same if you could get 225 million orangutans. <laughs> the result would be the same. 215 egotistical orangutans uh, with 20 straight flipping wins. But that doesn't make them skilled. It just means they're lucky, Stuart. Yeah. Ra random luck is not an investment strategy, of course. 
Um, and that's why, you know, I keep banging on about it, but that's why an evidence-based approach is so good. And also you've got to think about the risk, the risk associated with the investment. So if someone comes to me and says, Stuart, here's this sort of outlying suburb that's just about to go through, you know, some tremendous, it's going to get a train station, it's going to get a, a hospital, there's an arterial um, road that's going to start servicing it, all these sorts. Here's the great news story. Well, I can look at that and go, well, okay, I can go and buy a property in that um, in that location. I know myself, the first thing, if I did that, the first thing I'd be thinking about is what is my exit strategy? Cause it's not going to work forever. Um, but even if you thought, okay, it's a good long-term investment, you got to think about the risk. What's the risk? What's the probability of it generating over 7% compounding growth over the next 20 years compared to the likelihood of a different asset that has much, much stronger fundamentals and so it's really about taking, the, trying to earn the highest return for lowest risk. And the way that you can do that is level up on quality. So if I'm going to buy, if I'm going to buy a really high quality property, my chances of achieving at least a 7% return over a 20 year period are so incredibly high, you know, just because of the fundamentals of that particular asset. Whereas with conversely, with an asset that might seem a bit sexy, you know, I picked this growth suburb and, you know, the, the upside is so tremendous over the next five years, that might seem really attractive, but actually what I've done is just taken a much higher risk because there's a higher probability over a 20-year period, it's not going to generate 7%. And so part of it is returns, but a really big thing is trying to reduce investment risk. And the, really the best way you could do that is just just follow the masses or really the, the no. more successful property investors, <laughs> I should say. Follow the successful property investors. Yes. What have they done over yes. the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years yes. um, and just repeat that process? Rather than, uh, well, knowing that 50% of those who buy an investment sell up in the first five years. And again, once again, the ATO statistics came out showing that less than 92% of investors even get past their first or, or second property. And I think it all starts with having a plan. So buying a property is not a strategy. Buying a property and doing some research in your local area is not a plan. And I know at Pro Solution Private Clients, you've got a holistic approach, um, as do we at Metropole. And it all starts by planning to become the person you plan to become and then executing the plan. And the plan's based on evidence and fundamentals. So if people want to understand a bit more about what you and your team do at Pro Solutions, uh, just tell us a little bit about it, please, Stuart. Uh, well, we work with clients and inspire them to take a holistic approach to building wealth, which means that we understand that, there, that a lot of financial decisions are multifaceted, particularly properties. Property is a great one. You know, there's some borrowing considerations, cash flow, wealth accumulation, risk profile, um, taxation. There's a lot of things that go into, you know, executing a good property investment plan. And what we want to do is be at the center of that, our firm, to make sure that a client gets really good holistic advice. And the aim is really maximize wealth on an after-tax basis. And there's a lot of things that we can do, a lot of levers we can pull, whether it's credit in terms of loan structuring or tax or financial planning in order to achieve that. And since you don't sell property and since you don't even act as a buyer's agent, uh, that, that's a really good place to start. So you haven't got a bias in your advice. So I'll leave a note in the a link in the show notes about Pro Solutions. But I'd also recommend people subscribe to your a blog and I enjoy getting that every Wednesday. Hey, it was late last night. Something went wrong <laughs> with your blog, but I did listen to your Investopoly podcast and I'll leave a link to that in the show notes as well so people can catch up with you in between our regular sessions, Stuart. Yeah, I, I clearly don't know the difference between AM and PM. So I normally send out ten thirty AM, and I must have clicked PM. I clearly need a I clearly need a holiday. <laughs> it <before>. sounds like <laughs> you do. I know you've got one coming up, and I look forward to catching up with you again real soon, Stuart. Oh, it's been really fun. Thanks, Michael. I hope you got some benefit from my chat with Stuart. As you can see, he brings lots of depth to our discussions and we get together once a month. If you enjoyed this, but you're not currently a subscriber or a follower, before we go on to the next section, please just stop for a second, click on your podcast app and follow this podcast so that you twice a week get the information my great guests have got to share. In a moment, I'm going to share my mindset message with you, but I'd like to actually just share a little bit of trivia with you, a fun fact I read a little while ago. Now, you've probably read 
the, the total value of Australia's 10.9 million residential properties is getting close to $10 trillion now. But a trillion is an unfathomably large amount. It actually defies intuition. How much is a trillion? Here's a way to make a trillion more intuitive. One million seconds is two weeks. One billion, a thousand million seconds is 32 years. So one trillion, one thousand billion seconds is 32,000 years. Whoa. Whoa. So when we say Australia's residential property market is worth close to $10 trillion, that's a very, very large amount. And by the way, that's too big to fail. So it's easy to become numb when these crazy figures get tossed around in the media. It's also worth remembering that the total outstanding mortgage debt against all those properties is $2.2 trillion. I'm saying only $2.2 trillion. Now that I've told you how much a trillion is, <laughs> it's a silly thing to say. But having said that, that means that overall Australia's housing market's loan-to-value ratio is in the order of about 22 percent. That's not really a concern. There's no doubt that some people are ex experiencing a level of mortgage stress as interest rates have gone up so much, home buyers and also investors who didn't have big enough financial buffers or investors who've got large portfolios. But I guess the point I'm making is that overall Australia's housing market, its loan to value ratio is very comfortable and interest rates are very likely at their peak if nothing else they may go up one t more time so in general we're through the worst of that and the stats from all the research houses show that property prices continue to rise month after month so as you heard when i chatted with Stuart a while ago if you've been waiting for the market to bottom you missed it so what are you going to do about it how long are you going to wait to take advantage of this new property cycle? An opportunity like this to get in at the beginning of a new property cycle doesn't happen very often. Now, I don't advocate trying to time the market. In fact, that's what most people try and do, though, isn't it? They try and take advantage of it. So how long are you prepared to wait? Why not contact my team at Metropole? Go to metropole.com.au and have an obligation-free clarity consultation with one of our property strategists to discuss your goals, to discuss your options. We're much more than just ordinary buyers agents. We help our clients safely create intergenerational wealth through property. You've heard me say it so often on this podcast, property investment's a process, not an event. You can't just go off and buy a property and hope to be successful. You heard Stuart and me say the same. So formulating a property plan and getting the right advice is more critical than ever now. So why not have a chat with my team at Metropole? We don't have any properties for sale, but we offer you strategic advice and give you direction, results and clarity in these challenging times. Metropole.com.au now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's mindset message today, I'd like to talk about failures. Now hang on, how does failure fit in with success and motivation? Well, let me explain. I've had more than my share of failures, and if I want to be honest, most of them have been self-inflicted, but I've come to realise that too many people worry about failing. So I think failing is overrated, and I'd like to explain to you, let me give you actually six reasons why I think you shouldn't worry so much about failure. First of all, failing is never permanent. I know that sinking feeling that you get in your tummy, boy, have I had it more than my share of times, but it doesn't last forever. So the best way to reflect on your failure is to focus on the lessons that you've learned and the person you're going to become rather than spending time trying to avoid failure. The less time you spend on the rejection, the faster you're going to grow. The second message I'd like to give you about failing is to own up to your own failures, because the moment you openly talk about the things that make you vulnerable, they, they, they no longer have the power over you. People will appreciate your honesty, because everyone knows what it's like when they've had setbacks, when they've made mistakes. People are going to respect you for owning your own problems and embracing your failures. So when you own up to your own failures, you become stronger. Now, the third message about failures I want to give you is that the world isn't going to change unless you do. Let's be blunt, the world owes you nothing. It was here first, so we can't blame the other shortfalls, the things outside there in our lives, the, the people around us or the past decisions for, for we, our failures now. It's not the event that defines you, it's how you choose to react. So forget what others say, they're going to judge you anyway. If you want the world to change, 
change yourself first. Now, another thought about failure is how badly do you want it, whatever it was that you wanted that didn't work out. Remember, Steve Jobs once cleverly said, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. We've heard about Thomas Edison who made a thousand unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. But from his perspective, I didn't fail a thousand times, he said. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. Now, that's a smart way of thinking about it, isn't it? And I think it's important to realise that just because you failed at something doesn't mean that you, you're a failure. Never let failure deteriorate your own self-worth. If your head hurts, you say, I've got a headache. You don't say, I am a headache. Failure is nothing more than an event. Don't personalise it. And the last message I'd like to give you about failure is it's just part of the process. It happens. The fastest way to succeed is double your failure rate. Successful people have failed more times than a beginner's even tried. You've often heard me say, I'm a real success at failure. So if you want to succeed, fail faster. Well, thanks for spending the last little while with me, and I hope you got some benefit from this show. If you did, and you know somebody else who'd also benefit, please tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. There's a share button on every podcast app. On Apple Podcasts, there's three little buttons down the bottom, press it and share it, or just tell them about the Michael Yardney podcast. I hope you're going to be doing them a favour, and you'll definitely be doing me a favour and helping me in my quest to make as many people as possible financially literate. Now, there's ways of catching up with me between these shows. Just look for Michael Yardney on social media, or why not join my private Facebook group? Go to Facebook and look for the Property Update Facebook group. And I have a way of saying thank you to you for subscribing to this podcast. Go to podcastbonus.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes, podcastbonus.com.au, where you can get a bunch of ebooks and reports. My way of saying thank you. And when you've got time, why not listen to some of the old podcasts? There's individual lessons in each of those that I think would be helpful for you. I'll be back again real soon. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?